before we get started, do you mind if I just make myself um, a cup of soup? I forgot to have lunch and I don't really want to kind of faint, kind of at your feet in the middle of this interview, okay? I'm mildly see. offended. <laughs> No, really. I mean, I spend my I spend I spend my life teaching people how to make food in no time flat, and you want to make instant soup. My book, look, my book has a whole range of stuff you can make in five minutes or less. Hey, look, here's a really simple. Put it away. Put it away. I said, here's a simple idea: a soup you could make in less than five minutes. Yeah. One cup of chicken stock. Yeah. Bring it up to a boil. Take half a cup of chickpeas, pop it in, and a quarter of a cup of peas, and then just add half tab- a half tablespoon of flour, yeah. mix with a half tablespoon of butter, and it thickens up to the most glorious silky consistency. It's a basic velouté, chickpea soup. Anyone can do this. I, like you know, I think we're here for a proper interview. This is, this is yes. terrible, but where's the real questions? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no cup of soup. Okay, I won't offer you any either. No, I'm no, I wouldn't have shows. accepted. No worries. Hi everyone, I've got a special guest with me today. A slightly difficult one, but yeah. <laughs> Bar Stead from Better Homes and Gardens, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Now, you're here because of this... New book. This new book, The Everyday mm. Kitchen. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure, it started off as an idea that I had a number of years ago. Um, where My, my career has really been based in media uh, on trying to help people conquer Tuesday night dinner. There's a lot of people who show you how to throw a great dinner party or to discover some remote and exotic cuisine, but the reality is for most people, it's how do you eat well, healthy, consistently throughout the course of the week, and that's my own little niche. Here we have 52 unique concepts, each made up of four recipes. Sometimes they come together to make the one dish, Sometimes there are four different elements you can serve side by side, but whether it's seasonal, whether it's healthy, whether it's fast, whether it's indulgent, there's something for everybody. And you actually put forth a challenge for everyone in this book. I do. Do you want to tell us about this challenge? Yeah, look, I, I, it's pretty simple. You know, most people, we do a lot of research into what people actually cook at home um, through, through my media work. And the reality is that most people have no more than 12 recipes in their entire recipe book at any one time. So the average is actually seven. Now, if you're only cooking seven different meals at any period of your life, if you every month take one old recipe out and replace it with one new recipe, after a little over half a year, you've got an entirely new retinue. But plus, if you keep trying new things with the new skills that you learn, Start with a new recipe every month, then maybe every two weeks, then maybe one new one every week. I I promise you, by the end of the year, you won't need my book at all. And that's when my job's done. My job is to help you become empowered and better at cooking so you can learn to craft your own ideas. So let's start with, say, one new recipe a week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Even one a month. Even if 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 you're someone who's really reticent, one new one a month. And whether you're into seafood, meat, vegetarian, desserts, it doesn't matter. There's something for everyone in there. I think we can do it. It's very achievable. Do you have, you know, you know what we should do? We should probably, like, um, come up with a hashtag and actually get people onto this. Right. We need, we need the food challenge. Uh, yeah, because I'm, like, I'm happy to do it. One a week. It'll go through after a book challenge. Hashtag one a week. One of there. Hashtag one a week. Hashtag, Coming hashtag to a website near you. Guys. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook will never be the same again. Yeah. We're going to break the internet. Yeah, that's it. That's... You, in this book, you mentioned how you don't really subscribe to the superfood um, trend. No. Do you want to tell us why? Because it's crap. Um, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to put too blunt, but, but if you wanted to design, a, if you wanted to measure what a superfood is, um, let's think about what, what its parameters would be. It would be something which has a predictable, measurable, quantifiable improvement in human health and welfare that can transfer across communities, across cultures, it's affordable and it's accessible, yeah? There's only one food that actually, and you'd need to have actually done some research to prove this, not just hypothesis and anecdote. Now the reality is there's actually only one food for which there is enough cumulative evidence to be able to say that regular consumption in small affordable quantities actually has a measurable outcome on health and nutrition which is mushrooms mushrooms are a unique food though because they exist between the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom they are their own kingdom and have a little bit of both worlds but there are measurable proven improvements in uh 
in reducing risk of both breast cancer and prostate cancer, and a range of other things. It's high satiety, re reduces caloric intake. But for all these other foods, from your kale to your quinoa, your chia seeds to your blueberries, to be honest, and I, I don't want to speak in any way speculatively, all of this is, can be backed up by loads of peer-reviewed work. There just isn't the evidence that they have a measurable impact. What changes lives is changing your diet over a long period of time. No one food is going to do it. It's a lifestyle choice. It's about having a good balanced diet. Start with salad. More vegetables. I mean, Michael Pollan very famously had this wonderful quote. He said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I mean, it's a yeah. really good starting point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You also talk about being emotionally healthy. You're not really obsessing over what foods you eat. Because we do, a lot of people do. You know, it has to be organic, it has to be raw, it has to be blah, blah, blah. I think people are just you know, conjuring this circumstance where they give themselves a hard time for no reason in a range of different ways. I mean, whether I'm talking about you know, mothers uh, who are you know, parents to friends of ours or who worry that they're not being sufficiently good mums or you've got dads who kill themselves that they spend too much time at work or whether you have people say, oh, I, I can't believe I, there was no organic chicken available, little, little Oscar's never going to be the same again. Come on, get over it. Yes, it's really important to have good aspirations, but the most important thing you can do for yourself and for the people around you is to relax a little bit and enjoy life, you know? One lollipop's not gonna kill your kid. One bit of regularly farmed chicken's not gonna spoil dinner. Relax, have high aspirations, but enjoy it. And as much as else, if you're gonna be cooking, enjoy the process. Don't, don't get yourself worked into a tizzy over whether or not the onion is adequately sauteed, does it need one more minute? You know what's going to really influence enjoying dinner a whole lot more is the mood you're in. So be happy. Be happy. Be happy. Do you, um, at home when you're cooking, do you play certain music in the background just to kind of get you in the mood? When I'm allowed to control the music system, I'm um, sure. <laughs> but for me, I'm I will happily listen to Miles Davis all day, every day. But you know, I think maybe it's a little too introspective after a while. Yeah. Um, do you do anything else? Like you know, I know a lot of people take off their shoes when they want to cook or. Um, well, actually, my offside and I, Sarah, we, we, when we're doing recipe testing, we had this great stage last year where we we um, we went onto YouTube and we you can search like um, best songs of 1975, and there'll be like a playlist of 100 songs. And we actually started in 1965 and went all the way through to 2016. So it was over the space of two months. And so, like one day, it was all 1978 songs. Um, but at the moment, actually, my wife put me on to CeeLo Green and Daryl Hall. Oh, if you haven't heard this, great. I heard that. No, no, no. So CeeLo Green went to Daryl Hall's place of Hall and Oates fame, uh, and they're re-recording all of Daryl Hall's famous tracks, and CeeLo's great, so there you go. Yeah. I t with music, I tend to be put onto the good ideas. That's what you should do in your next book. You have a CD attached. A CD? What's that? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Have now Spotify. <laughs> Do you know it's funny uh, when Spotify I when I was about eighteen, someone did that. It was a book called Hot Food Cool Jazz, which was a cookbook with a CD of songs that you know, and it was you know matching the food to the music. I think I owned that. You might yeah. be onto something. Yeah, you need uh, your own kind of channel. Just need to find something to play a CD on. <laughs> Tape recorder. Yeah. Yeah. Bring back the cassette. Yeah. Um, okay, just lastly, I want to play a little game with you. Yes. So I'm going to put forward some scenarios. Yes. Now, I want you to tell me from this book which recipe that people should choose mm. in this scenario. Okay, yes. so number one. Yep. The exhausted parents. Mm -hmm. So they've worked all day. Yep. They've picked up their kids. Mm -hmm. They've taken them to sport, you know, to ballet, to soccer. They've come home. They've yep. done the homework. They're exhausted. Yep. What do they cook because they really don't have enough time? And they just want to go to bed. So you're talking about something that's ready in maybe 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you've got, well, are you assuming you've got some ingredients at home, yeah? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, here's a really good example, okay? So these are flathead spiadini, yeah. and it sounds really glamorous. Spiadini is just a talent for skewers. And so all we've done is we've taken some beautiful pieces of flathead, or you could use swordfish or whatever you want, a little bit of sage and a wrap of some pancetta or serrano ham, and thread those on, and then the lovely smokiness of the barbecue. You get a bit of a hand from the kids to put them together, that takes five minutes, they take 10 minutes to cook, 15 minutes later that's ready to go. Meanwhile, you open a can of lentils, uh, pop those into a pan with only half the water that was there, dice an onion, chop some parsley, a little bit of lemon and some other little bits and pieces like olives if you want, and so you have the, the skewers and the lentil salad, 20 minutes tops. Delicious, healthy, light and pulses are so good for you. Um, maybe something alternative, you might, oh, 20 minutes? Oh, 
This is a, a soup you can make in 22 minutes, all right? Greek bean soup, good vegetarian choice. Uh, 22 minutes start to finish. Or even just something really old fashioned and simple. Perfect your classic omelette, a souffle omelette. Now, this is made with uh, asparagus and goat's cheese, but it can be adapt the filling can be adapted for anything the kids are gonna go for. And what's interesting about that recipe is you're learning the technique of how to make the perfect fluffy omelette with a lovely golden crust. And I'll tell you what, that's six minutes start to finish. Six minutes. Bam. All right, what about if you've got a disapproving mother-in-law who is just never impressed with Remarry. Re it's very simple, you remarry. <laughs> All right, there's no recipe for that. <laughs> Thank you for that, no. no. If you want, you want to impress, well look, I would say probably you'd be looking at something like a cake. I mean, you want to make something where it sort of says, I, uh, I, I feel you a little bit. So how about magnificent coconut and lime, lime cheesecake this is that classic baked cheesecake. And what's great about this recipe is the technique you learn in making this cheesecake, you can then adapt to every cheesecake you want. So it's never dry, okay. it never splits, and it is always just silky smooth and amazing. I, 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 look, or chocolate. Well, the chocolate's more for the girlfriend you want to attach yourself to because I've always said to every young man I meet, any young man who can make chocolate is never lonely on a Saturday night. So. Dave True story. From Fast Ed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's your own YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, all right, so that kind of brings me on to the next one. Yeah. So your, you know, your loved one is coming over to your place and you're cooking them dinner for the first time. Right. What's the first thing? You first do? rule: don't make something you've never made before. Mm. Whether it's Christmas, whether it's uh, an important event, or whether it's a date, if the food really matters, make sure you're cooking something you know. The number of people who try to make new recipes on Christmas Day and then watch the day fall apart, hilarious. Um, look, for me, um, I think if it's a first date, you need to demonstrate a couple of things. You need to demonstrate that you're capable, yeah. that you're confident, because everyone digs confidence. Whether you're a guy or a girl, everyone digs confidence. And that you're a little bit, a little bit worldly. And so you want to have that sense that you know a bit about the world. So what about a Creole style chicken. So it's, a, it's an inexpensive thing that's very difficult to get wrong where it's literally a matter of just searing off the, uh, the chicken and then it gets cooked slowly in a lovely little spice mix. You'll find it here on page, well it's, it's recipe number 31, so page 158. So you're gonna have the Creole chicken. Homemade cornbread takes five minutes put together, half an hour to cook, and the red rice. You can say, you take them on a little trip down the bayou and say, how's it going, man? <laughs> Yeah, well, you, yeah, but you don't need to. It only cooks for half an hour, which is about how long the chicken takes. And fresh cornbread, when it's piping hot, soaking up the juices from the Creole chicken. I'd be back for seconds. Not necessarily just at the meal. <laughs> get it? Yeah. I get it, I get it. All right, last one. Yeah. Um, so you've had a big night out. Mm-hmm. Come home. Mm-hmm. What's the dish that's going to soak up all that alcohol in your system? You're not going to find this recipe in the book. <laughs> I'm going to give you a freebie. This is from me. This is an old chef's trick from way back. Because, uh, I don't know, chefs, yeah, so we finish at 11, 11.30 at night. You have a couple of beers. You might come home and have one more before bed. It's one o'clock in the morning. You just need something to eat. This is what I used to live on for years when I was working in restaurants. So you get yourself a really good quality instant miso soup. Okay? And you just make the soup. You know, I was bagging you for your instant soup. But, so, instant miso soup. And then you got that, you simmer in a saucepan. You don't just rehydrate it. You add some peas and asparagus, right? And then uh, peas, asparagus. I add some chickpeas for a bit of bulk. And then don't diss me on this. You've got to try it before you diss me. Half a tablespoon of peanut butter. Just trust me. Just okay. trust me. It has a big umami effect and it makes it thick and amazing. And you can quite happily go to bed and there's no hangover the next morning. We've got your next book sorted. It comes with a CD and yeah. a hangover cure. Fantastic, and a breathalyzer on the cover. <laughs> What's next for you? For me, well, we're um, we're always developing new content. My team and I develop about twelve hundred new recipes every year. Um, so, Test Kitchen is a place I spend a lot of time. But in terms of of a new book, sometime in the future. I mean, I don't write books unless I've got something to say. Uh, some, some of my mates will publish a cookbook every year. For me, it's been five years between drinks. But that means you can guarantee next time I want to publish something, it's because I've got something really great to offer you. So uh, I don't know when it'll be, but when it comes out, I promise you, you'll love it. Thank you so much for joining you're us very today, Ed. If you're interested in Ed's work or any of his Which you are. Books, you're interested. <laughs> or any of his previous books, yeah. pop on over to booktopia.com.au.
Thanks for joining us. Great pleasure.